Hello and welcome to the another episode of the world of physics. Now today we are going to start with the remaining topics of the pressure measurement. Previously we have discussed about the YouTube manometer. Now today in this session we begin with the inclined manometer. It is nothing but the modified version of a YouTube manometer. In YouTube manometer if you have seen that there was in one YouTube, one end of the tube was connected to the system where pressure is to be found out. And the other end, the left leg was such that the, where we intend to uh, we measure the height of a manometric fluid liquid. Okay, so same thing happens, but in this system, there is one tank in between the system and the manometer. Okay, there was there is one tank, and this limb is inclined at some angle rather than vertically 90 degree, it is now inclined at some angle. Okay, so as you can see in the figure, there is one point, okay, in a system at the center, there is one point where the pressure is to be found out, means the head is to be found out, okay. So as you can see in the figure, inclined manometers are more sensitive than the vertical manometers as I have told you earlier. Initially, when there is no fluid flowing into the pipe, the level of the manometer liquid is at x x dash. Okay, as you can see the datum line x x dash. Imagine the pressure in the fluid is absent. The manometer liquid will be at x x dash. But due to the liquid pressure in the pipe, the level of the manometer liquid moves down from x x dash to the y y dash in the tank and rises into the right limb to the distance h two from the x axis means the height is risen by amount that is h2 so let us uh, let us first of all clear the variables over here so means we are using two fluids over here s1 and s2 uh, means fluid 1 and fluid 2 let us say for fluid 1 s1 is the specific gravity of a liquid for which pressure has to be determined means s1 uh, the fluid 1 is the material which is flowing through the pipe and whose pressure is to be determined. S2 is the specific gravity of the manometric liquid. Delta H is the fall in the le liquid level, okay, in the tank. Capital A is the area of the cross section of the tank. And small a is the area of the section of the right leg where the manometric fluid has risen. H is the head pressure of the fluid in the pipe, okay. So, H that is the head is nothing but the pressure one unit of the pressure pressure can also be defined as a unit of head of water or mm of hg it can also be said as okay so as you can see in the figure by equilibrium condition we know that upward pressure means this uh, this direction acting pressure is equal to again this side pressure means that is how uh, the Pressure from both the ends are equal, thus the liquid has maintained the same level. So imagining the pressure inside the fluid is H plus whatever the fluid is there in the uh, tank. Okay, that is that pressure that is H plus H1 plus delta H into S1. Okay, so that is the pressure of the fluid 1 is equal to pressure of the fluid 2 that is equal to H2 plus delta H into S2. So by solving this equation we get the head H is equal to small a into H2 by capital A in bracket S2 minus S1 plus H2 S2 minus H1 S1. Okay. So that is all about the method of finding the head using an inclined manometer. Now, if you think of a condition, if the tube is inclined to the reservoir at an angle A, as shown alpha, as shown in figure, okay, so then H2 is equal to L sin alpha, we can say that H2 is equal to L sin alpha, if we assume that small a by capital A, okay, if small a is very very less than capital A, because capital A is the area of the tank, small a is the area of the small tube. If we take off this ratio, this ratio becomes very small. Okay, that is equivalent to 0. 0.000, 0 something is that. Then, 
H becomes, so we can ignore that term, cap, uh, small a by capital A. So ignoring that term, we get H is equals to L sin alpha S2 minus H1 S1. So we have replaced H2 with L sin alpha, okay, using the trigonometric rule. So that is all about the inclined manometer. Now let's discuss about the burden due pressure gauge. So now if you recall that if you have filled the air in the two-wheeler or four-wheeler vehicle, okay, so you see there is one device with that, okay, that small device with a pointer in that and it gives the indication in PSI. Normally in the vehicle, two-wheeler or four-wheeler, we use 35 PSI, okay, for pressure measurement. So that device is known as a burden tube pressure gauge. If you have not noticed it yet, Go to the station, fuel station and try to fill the air in the vehicle, okay? In the wheels of the vehicle, let me be very clear, okay? So let us first of all define, uh, discuss about burden tube pressure gauge. So as you can see in this GIF, the pointer is moving, okay? So with the respect to that pointer, you can see that. Now with respect to the pointer, if you will notice that, if the pressure is increased in the tube, the tube will elongate. Okay, so by deformation of that elastic tube, the pointer will be moving, such a kind of mechanism is set in that, the gearing mechanism is set that it gives the accurate value of the pressure and the outside dial gauge is calibrated for such small deformation, this much amount of pressure. So that, cal that uh, calculation is known as a calibration. So the seat type burden tube consists of a long thin walled cylinder of a non-circular cross section sealed in, sealed at one end, made from the materials such as a phosphor bronze, steel and beryllium copper and attached by a light line work to mechanism with operate the pointer. As you can see over here as I have discussed that this tube under the pressure will deform, it is connected to the link and the sector which is further connected to the gearing mechanism and their gearing mechanism will circulate the pointer and that pointer will reflect some indication on the dial gauge and that dial gauge is calibrated so as to give the value of the pressure. Okay, so further the other end of the tube is fixed at one end, uh, is fixed and is open for the application of the pressure which is to be measured. The tube is soldered or welded to the socket at base through which the pressure connection is made and as the fluid under the pressure enters the burden tube it rises to the change the section of the tube from oval to circular and this tends to the straighten out of the tube okay so because of the pressure the tube the section of the tube tube will change and thus it will move the mechanism that is the overall idea so the resulting movement of the free end of the tube causes the pointer to move over the scale. The tip of the burden tube is connected to a segmental lever through an adjustable length link. The lever length also may be adjustable and the segmental lever end of the segment side is provided with a rack which matches to a suitable pinion mounted on a spindle. So the segmental lever is suitably provided uh, sorry, suitably pivoted and the spindle holds the pointer as shown in figure. Any error due to the friction in the spindle bearing is known as lost motion. So this was all about the DAF. Uh, so this was all about the burden tube pressure gauge. Now the modified version of the burden tube pressure gauge is the diaphragm pressure gauge. Over here, instead of this uh, move, moving cross section we use a bellows or metal diaphragm okay so th that is how the system is known as a diaphragm pressure gauge similar thing happen over here when the uh, pressure is applied the diaphragm is kind of thing moving bending okay as you can see over here if the pressure is applied it will bend like this under no pressure it will straighten out under the effect of the springs okay or the uh, or the restoring force okay so it consists of a thin flexible diaphragm made from materials such as the brass or the bronze a pointer is attached to the diaphragm as shown in figure 
the force of the pressure against the effective area of the diaphragm causes a deflection of the diaphragm. As I told you earlier, because of the pressure, the deflection will be there and it will uh, move the mechanism of the pointer. So in some cases, the deflection of a diaphragm is opposed by the spring quantities of the diaphragm itself and in other cases, spring is added to limit the deflection of the diaphragm. Okay, as you can see over here, that is the diaphragm gauge. So, a motion of diaphragm operates an indicating or a recording type of an instrument, a metallic diaphragm gauge as shown in figure, is of very useful in industries to measure the pressure. Okay, so this was all about the diaphragm pressure gauge. Now, let us move on to the next pressure gauge, that is the vacuum gauge. It is also known as a McLeod gauge. So let's talk about the McLeod gauge. As you can see, the McLeod gauge with the mercury is below cutoff point as of now. So the McLeod gauge works by taking a sample of a gas from a vacuum chamber and then compressing it by tilting and infilling with mercury. As in this McLeod gauge, the pressure is calculated by using the Boyle's law as I told you earlier. So we have to first apply the pressure to the known volume of the gas. So the pressure that we want to measure or the initial pressure P1 is applied to the top of the reference column. As you can see over here, there is one reference capillary or the reference column. So at that point, we have to apply some known pressure. The mercury level is raised by pressing the piston down and then after applying the pressure as you can see over here there is a mercury reservoir we have to increase the pressure on the mercury reservoir by pressing the piston downward side okay so as the piston is pressed down the mercury level in the reservoir decreases and mercury level in the mercury capillary increases at the other end the mercury level capillary will be increased okay so the mercury level in the mercury capillary is bought just below the cutoff point and at this point the applied pressure fills the bulb and the capillary okay it fills the bulb and the capillary after the bulb and the capillary is filled the piston is again operated and the mercury level in the gas uh, gauge increases and reach to the cutoff point. So again the procedure is repeated and the cutoff point is reached again. So when the mercury level reaches the cutoff point, a known volume of gas is trapped in the bulb and the mercury capillary. When we are increasing the level of the mercury to the cutoff point, at the same time we have noted that the volume of the gas in the bulb and measuring capillary, the volume is known as the initial volume. So we know the initial volume and the initial pressure, P1 and V1. After that, the piston is again operated and the mercury level is further raised to the trapped gas in the bulb. Now we have to fill the whole mercury level. As you can see in this figure now, this figure when the is the, of the condition when the mercury reaches to the zero reference point. Okay, so the mercury level is increased to the point so that it reaches to the zero reference. After the compression, the volume of the gas is again noted, and this volume will be called as the final volume, and the volume is read directly by the scale. Now you can see there is a measuring scale 0, 1, 2, 3. By that we can directly calculate the or measure the reading of the volume. Now over here we have three things. Initial pressure, initial volume and final volume. But the final pressure is not known to us. So we know the Boyle's law formula. P1 V1 is equals to P2 V2 and by this we can directly calculate the value of P2. So that is according to the Boyle's law. The difference in the height of the measuring capillary and the reference capillary which is noted by H is a measure of a volume and the pressure of the trapped gas. After that, this we know the final volume V2, the final pressure P2 and we already know the initial volume. So from these values, we will find the value of pressure P1. So now let us suppose the volume of the bulb from the cutoff point to the beginning of the measuring capillary is equal to V. 
area of the cross section of the measuring capillary is equal to a measuring capillary height hc initial volume of the gas which is trapped in the bulb and measuring capillary v1 is equal to v1 plus a into hc so initial or applied pressure of the gas p1 that is unknown pressure which we need to find out when the mercury reaches to the zero reference point in the reference capillary uh, reference capillary the final volume v2 is equals to ah so final pressure p2 is equals to p1 plus h so according to the boyle's law we know p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 instead of p2 we can substitute it as p1 plus h instead of v2 we can substitute ah so by solving that we get the equation p1 is equals to making the p1 as a subject ah square divided by v1 minus ah the product ah will be very small and it can be neglected thus <coughs> p1 is equals to ah square divided by v1 so this was all about maclaurin gauge so another one vacuum gauge is the firani gauge okay so let us discuss about that so firani gauge is a kind of a temperature based pressure measuring device okay it consists of a two wire filaments one filament serves as a reference and the and it is sealed in an evacuated glass as shown in figure you can see over here it is sealed in an sealed in an evacuated glass while the other filament is kept in a container where it is connected to the source of the pressure the two filaments are connected in a bridge circuit as shown in figure so operating principle is like that if the resistance of the two pirani elements are equal no current flows through the ammeter but if the resistance of one pirani element changes the current will flow through ammeter means you can see that because of the pressure there will be a certain volume and the bridge will be in a balanced condition if there is no pressure okay so the resistance is same because of the pressure there will be some sort of a induced temperature and because of that the resistance will change and the bridge will be now in an unbalanced condition thus the current will flow through the ammeter of the resistance uh, of the uh, western bridge okay so this current flow indicates a change in the pressure of the gas being measured means so for a gas we all know that pressure is directly proportional to temperature at constant volume okay so using that fundamental with the change in pressure there exists a change in temperature and because of the change in temperature there will be a change in resistance into the wire or the filament so that is how the pirani gauge is operated and pirani gauges are used for measuring pressure range of about 10 to 5 okay 10 to minus 5 to 1 torr okay 10 to minus 5 to 1 torr torr is a unit of vacuum so this was all about the pressure guys That's it for today. Thanks for watching.